So is there a way then that like, is there like telltale signs where someone might go, okay, I think I'm getting close to internet gaming disorder here. Or is there, is it not that simple that you could just go like, like a checklist almost? I think you, uh, you can absolutely use some of the checklists. Um, just take them with a grain of salt. I think, you know, the best right. the best thing that you can do is if you have access to someone with clinical, clinical expertise, if you can get in touch with a therapist or a doctor, then of course that is the best way to find out whether this is something that is really problematic or something that you can maybe manage yourself. Um, but if to get some kind of initial indications, then I think, I think the checklists can be a useful just, you know, time to reflect to see whether you think that these things apply to you so the one that i mentioned earlier withdrawal if you feel like you're irritable and and frustrated and annoyed when you can't play games that's that's one that kind of consistently predicts a little bit lower well-being in general so that's one to look out for um the yeah the the if you're feeling like gaming is displacing other activities that you're doing gaming instead of um Kind of other important life activities if you're not hanging out with your friends because you want to play games and that you know mm. if you're hanging out with your friends in games it's of course a separate thing but if you're kind of skipping social opportunities to play games regularly um that's another one to look out for so if you yeah if you google gaming disorder questionnaire i think they're worthwhile if you think you might have a problem to just as a check-in but okay. don't don't let the you know if, if it gives you a little classification at the end take that with a, a large grain of salt yeah, it's not like a final, like, like self-diagnosed kind of, kind of deal. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause, um, we, we, I talk a lot like on our platforms as well, like the difference between like being sad and depression. And I think, um, cause of course I think like, even like you mentioned in lockdown, I went through periods of time where I was playing a serious amount of games every day. But I think that was relatively normal in lockdown. I think it depends on the circumstance. Obviously, it was going through like a pandemic. Um, so it makes a big difference. I literally just killed myself, apparently, in the oh, game. I've been there. Oh, I didn't even know you could do that. That's very sad. Um Yeah, I yeah, I think that makes I think that makes a big big difference. Um and I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one more example because that's one that I meant to to this connects to I think a lot of what we're talking about, which is if you ever feel like you want to change something about your engagement with the games, you want to play less or you want to play with different people or you want to play you want to you know pick your stopping points better, uh, and you feel like you can't, that's that's maybe actually the best one to look out for. So I think withdrawal is is a good one too, but that's wanting to control your play and then feeling like you can't that that really is one of the top ones to look out for and that'll show up in those questionnaires as well right okay so like you you've become self-aware you understand that maybe you should game less or not game at certain times with certain people but you can't stop exactly okay that's interesting so similar to that as in i imagine other addictions um yeah yeah Okay. But I think actually I do actually think that uh gaming is a little bit unique here in that um the data that we have from clinical studies and you know individuals talking about their lived experience struggling with games is actually one of quite a lot of self-awareness. I think there is less maybe a little bit less often the case that people are kind of trying to hide their addiction or deceive it or you know lie to themselves about their problem. Um, in gaming, there does really seem to be quite a lot of self-awareness about, I, I realize that I'm playing a little bit more than I'd like to, and I'm just having trouble actually taking that next step and, and doing it less. Right. Okay. So that, that's a good thing then. Like, I, I suppose, um, acknowledging that is kind of the first step in any, in any kind of like rehabilitation, if you will. I'm not sure how you'd word that. Um, yeah. but it, it, like becoming less, uh, less of an issue in your everyday life. Um, so, I mean, we spoke about escapism. And we spoke about symptoms. I, I think we, we spoke about games too, multiplayer games. But I mean, like games can be so different. I mean, like we're playing like a version of Snake now, but to like single player games like Spider-Man and, and the media paints games in such a bad light, like games like GTA. And did you find like any, I don't know if you did this with your research, but any games in particular, like like not just multiplayer games, but like a certain game that made it worse, like GTA, does that inherently make people more violent? Well, I can safely head that one off. Uh, at this <laughs> point, 
I think the debate is settled science. It's, I, I would say in the research community, it's not quite there yet, but the momentum is certainly shifting. Yeah. Um, I'm firmly convinced that there is no meaningful link between violent video game play and subsequent violence or aggression or yeah. indeed any other negative uh, negative behavior, antisocial behavior, anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, violent video games are not ruining society or your kids uh, or yourself. Okay, That's, good. <laughs> that we can say pretty safely. Beyond that, whether there are some games that are kind of more uh, detrimental or at least have greater potential to be detrimental to mental health than others, um, I would say that's also kind of a, an area in development mm -hmm. uh, in terms of research. But uh, I can I can happily point to one of my colleagues' works who does work on uh, predatory monetization. That's one what? area that I, I'm a little bit concerned about, that there are games that really do kind of manipulates player psychology in a way to get them to spend more than they would be normally be comfortable spending or more than they realize that they've spent. So then we're talking about a little bit more financial harm as opposed to mental health, yeah. but those, those two things go often go very close to hand in hands. Mm -hmm. um, so there are kind of mobile games that verge on, on predatory in that way that I'm concerned about beyond that. I think, I think really almost any game can be played in a way that's really supportive for mental health or be played in a way that's really unsupportive for mental health. And we're still working on, you know, what exactly differentiates those two. Right. Okay. So it's like completely dependent. There's no like, if this game is played, then yes. Like it's not like an easy formula like that. No, I'm not aware of any convincing research on, you know, players of MOBAs are, you know, more or less depressed than players of sports games or, or anything like that. Or right. Okay. In particular, uh, players of FIFA are more or less depressed than players of, of League. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's so dependent on the context of play, not just the the content of what's in that game.